Welcome to the Bootstrap Founder. Today, I'm talking to Evelyn J. Starr. Evelyn is a brand building expert, and we'll talk about finding the right niche, having a community-centric long-term perspective, and how brands change over time. Here's Evelyn. What is the, the biggest misconception about building a brand that you have run into with solopreneurs or indie entrepreneurs? What have you found with, with yeah, being the biggest problem there? The biggest misperception I've, I've seen is that there's a belief that a brand is just a logo and it's just something that marketing creates and maybe they'll get to it, maybe they won't get to it. And they don't realize that the brand is really the whole business. So, you know, the reason that you're in business is part of your brand. You as the founder are a big part of the brand, especially in the beginning when it's just you. Um, so you bring your personal values, you bring your personality, and all of these things color the brand in people's minds. You know, my my definition of a brand is that it's the expectation of what you get when you deal with any entity based on all your prior experiences and, and impressions of that entity. And so, you know, how I feel about the Bootstrap founder is very much how I feel about our interactions, Arvid, because that has built the brand in my mind. It's what I expect. Next time I talk to you, I know, oh, Arvid, he's friendly. He's really helpful. Um, he's very interested in brand issues and also building in public. All of those things factor into what the bootstrap founder is in my mind. Do you think like the, the other brands in the space, you would probably call them competitors, although for me, it's just like other people doing similar things that I can, we can empower each other in our community, at least it's not that much of a competition. Do you think these other brands influence what perception people might have of my brand as well? Not really. Not really. And that's the thing that I, the message I would send to a lot of uh, entrepreneurs starting out is it's good to be aware of what the competition is doing, but you don't define yourself by what the competition is doing. You are your own brand. Hopefully you've come to your business because you've noticed a gap in the marketplace that your competitors aren't filling. And so you're going to define your brand and your niche along those lines. And so it's like I said, it's good to keep an eye out to see what changes happen in the marketplace. If they invade your space, if you see something they're doing, you think, aha, I can do this better. Um, you know, those ideas can come to you, but you don't define yourself by your competitors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, generally a good idea is uh, not to compare yourself to other people anyway, right? Yes. Because you, know, you only see their highlight reel while you see your full picture. And it's kind of uh, an unfair comparison to yourself, I would guess. But yeah. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I, I do wonder in, in that regard, because with competitors around, you, you kind of that's why you do a lot of marketing is to, to be able to differentiate yourself from your competitors. And th that's why I'm asking this question, because if, if you have a, a brand, and I, this might be a very limited perspective on brand that is similar to others, how do you give some kind of substantial difference throughout through your marketing to the people in your field so they can see, okay, yeah, this is not just a slightly different product, but the, the, the people behind it, the mission, the vision behind it is different too. How do you do that? Well, um, you know, when you're... When you're first starting out, sometimes you don't know the full nature of your brand, right? Maybe you've seen a gap in the marketplace and you thought, I can program that. I can fix that, sort of like what you did with Permalink. Um, and so you start very focused on a product. But ultimately, if you're going to have a fully realized brand, your brand's going to have a purpose that surmounts a product. You know, maybe for Permalink, it's to help Amazon publishing authors make sure their books don't get booted off, <laughs> right? And and so there may be other products or other things you devise in the future. I'm, I'm making this up, but um, the uh, most brands that are going to survive long term have a purpose that's not product related. It's a bigger world vision. Um, and I'll give you a couple examples, um, although these are not tech examples. But well, I, actually, I can read you Google's. Google's ex um, purpose is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Okay, so there's 
the, the word search isn't in there anywhere, right? There's no maps, there's, you know, and it's what's made them, uh, it's what's guided them to develop a whole lot of products and then also to ditch a whole lot of products. And when I wrote my book, they had already killed off, I don't know, 240 somewhat products that just didn't adhere or fly, um, but that they thought might be a good idea based on that purpose. Um, so, you're, you differentiate yourself by your purpose, you differentiate yourself by the values that you bring to your business, you know, how you go about doing your business and um, the values that you set for your business guide how you want your employees to behave on your behalf if you're fortunate enough to grow your business to the point where you have employees. Um, at your niche also is a differentiator you know, going after exactly the same thing as another competitor, if you have a different method of doing it or some sort of improvement might be a good idea, but usually it's better to find some space that very few or no one occupies and use that to differentiate yourself. So these are some of the brand components that help you stand out. And the one last thing I want to say and, and challenge conversation a little bit is that I want your listeners to know that marketing is about relationship building. It's not just about differentiation. That's part of how you do it. But it's really what is your brand in relation to these people and, and they relate to other people. So it's going to be the founder and your employees. That's, that is very important that I've been very focused on telling people the exact same message that anything you want to do for your business that has any long term positive beneficial effect has to be relationship based. It can't just be like projecting something. It has to be building an actual connection with human beings. I really enjoy the fact that you say this because it's it's core to the message that I'm trying to communicate as well. And in, in that regard, I, I'm thinking of, of personal brand and a professional brand. That's kind of my distinction that I use, right? Personal brand is around the founder. Professional brand is around the the, the purpose that you just described. The, those, those kind of terms are what I use for this. Because a lot of founders in my space who want to build relationships, who want to become part of a community and from within that community build products that people actually need and have a budget for and all that kind of stuff, they, they struggle with, well, what is the, the core of what I'm supposed to be a brand about? Like, is it me as the founder or is it the product and the mission that I have? What would you suggest for somebody who's a solopreneur, who doesn't have a team and doesn't really want to build a big company out of it, but does want to build a business? What is the core of their brand? Is it the person or the business or both? How do they go about it? Well, they, they overlap so much. They meld so much that I, w I don't really make a distinction between them because if you're the founder and you're a solopreneur and you're interacting with everybody, you are the brand. You really are. Um, and so one of the things that I found really helpful in my journey in the book that I sent you um, was to scope out, to actually set for myself, what is my purpose, right? As, as you know, my brand is East Star Associates, the name I came up with in 1999 in a hurry when someone asked me to interview for something when I decided to go out on my own. I'm like, ah, oh, I got to find something. Um, but um, so, you know, I sat down and actually I went through um, at one point, Simon's next, you know, determine your why. And I, I did that first and then I determined my company's purpose. So my personal why and my company's purpose are not the same, but they dovetail. You know, my, my personal why is to help someone find the aha moment so they can move forward. Um, uh, because I'm very analytical and I'm very big picture and I can usually help somebody who's stuck f find a way through that. Um, but my business purpose is that I help business owners make confident marketing decisions. So that's a slice of the aha moment. So maybe that's a way to look at the personal brand and the professional brand a little bit. Um, the that's other awesome. thing, that's oh, so, sorry about that. This, that's just in intriguing to, to have this kind of this is my whole purpose and the business is just a slice of it. Kind of, uh, there's, for me, I've always found like we all have these overlapping identities as people, right? We're, we're parents, we're, we're children, we're neighbors and all of that. And this kind of plays into the same overlap of purposes, right? We have the, the full purpose as a person and the business is just one way of fulfilling that purpose and maybe being a parent is another purpose or being a woodworker in your spare time is the other version. It's, it's nice to see that you, you found 
found this big purpose and you have this specific purpose for your business. That is really cool. Sorry for interrupting, but no, that that's is great. something that I find really cool. That's great. And, you know, and for your listeners, I really, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, I don't have time to do this. I have to tell you, when you find your purpose, when you figure that out, and, and notice how simple it is. I help business owners make confident marketing decisions, you know, it's like eight or nine words, right? And But it's talking about who I serve and what I do, and it's not product specific. If you're um, audience, if you take the time to do this, then you have something to run all of your opportunities by. It becomes a litmus test and it becomes so much easier to make decisions. If someone approaches you for a partnership or if someone says, hey, can you add these three benefits to the what you're building? You know, and you want to think, hmm, should I bother? Should I not? If you have your purpose, you have sort of a, a lens to look at that and say, yeah, this fits or no, it doesn't. It makes life so much easier in the long run. Yeah, you, you talked about the niche uh, that you pick very, very early in our conversation. And I think niche picking or picking your future audience or your market or whatever you call it, right? The being specific about who you want to serve and empower, that conversation cannot come early enough in a business journey. Like if, if you do this, at the, when you start selling things, you're already way too deep into it. So let, let's maybe talk about the niche now at the beginning of this conversation as well, because it's uh, it's just an, a really extremely important uh, thing for any founder to, to consider. What's too big? What's too small? That's one one of the questions that I always get from, from founders that I try to help as well. Like when I pick a niche, it, how is can I go too deep or am I too broad? Do you have any kind of framework for this? How to, to pick a niche that is just right? The Goldilocks kind of niche? I do. I do. And I'm going to uh, mention to your listeners that I wrote a book called Teenage Waste Brand, How Your Brand Can Stop Struggling and Start Scaling. And I actually have step-by-step -step instructions on how to look at niches in there. So if they're interested, they can check out that book. Um, but what I would say to you here is that you, what you want in a niche is to be very specific so you can talk to a particular customer. A particular customer is a particular problem. Okay, and, and it could be pretty narrow. You just want to have some running room so your brand can grow for several years. Okay, you know, if there are five people in the world who need what you have, you know, you're going to run out of that audience or pitching to that audience really fast. But you don't need hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. You just need the right people and enough of them so that your brand can continue to grow for a while and you can make a name for yourself. And that is what's most important about a niche and what people get wrong is that the biggest fear uh, founders have is that they're going to go too narrow. They're going to leave money on the table. When If they're going to say no to somebody, they're purposely limiting their business. And that feels very scary. You know, um, I call it in my book that, you know, my book Teenage Weast Brand talks about how there are sort of adolescent symptoms to brands. And I call it suffering from FOMO, fear of missing out, right? If I, if I don't serve that person, you know, I have this major, uh, I'm missing the party kind of feeling. But what's really the case is that when you target some specific audience, whether it's by an attitude or, or uh, a group of people you're serving, you make a name for yourself in that arena. You have to have something, and this goes back to differentiation, right? Right? You know, Permalink is one of the only services I know, I think the only service I know that does what it does. And so... That was amazing to me. That was exactly what I needed. I saw it on Jane Friedman's newsletter and I was like, yeah, I'm there. So um, that was speaking directly to me and my problem. And I don't know how many authors are worried about their books getting kicked off of Amazon because a link goes bad. But I think there are probably enough of them that your business is growing <laughs> because it's a big problem. Um, so I would encourage your listeners to think choose an audience narrow enough that they when someone sees the brand and sees what it's about they say oh that's exactly what I needed or oh yes they're talking to me um, and you can't be that specific if you're trying to target everybody have you found a good way of finding the places where you can do this research like where do you go to look for information on the size of the niche or if people are actually having problems that you're interested in solving how would you approach that uh, you know, it's an industry by industry situation. You know, I'm I'm a big uh, secondary research person, so I will put in my browser all sorts of terms that come at 
that this is where I would start with any of them, all sorts of terms that come at the problem I'm trying to solve to see who the players are. Um, I would you know, go to each of the players' websites. I would look at any public information or, or ask about, uh, look for reviews, look for statistics. Um, and, and really what I'm looking for in that case, especially, I think I'll probably a lot of your listeners are going after something that either hasn't existed before or is fairly new. So you don't have to have button down numbers to justify what you're doing. You just have to ascertain that there's enough interest and enough of a market there um, that you could build your brand for a few several years right um, that that's all you're looking for you know so you don't need to know specifically how many there are you just need to know that there are enough yeah you're kind of validating tra a trajectory right you, you don't necessarily yes. have the, the precise numbers but you know that the vector of it is pointing somewhere upwards in some capacity i think that's yes. that's a great it's that's great advice i i feel like understanding that there are already players in a particular field, but people are not too happy with them. That's probably one of the best kind of situations that particularly a bootstrap founder can find themselves in, right? Yes. Because you know that there's budget because people are already paying for, for these other things. You know that there is interest because otherwise they wouldn't even have attempted to build the thing that they now are, are being paid for, those, those businesses. And you know that there's a misalignment between the products uh, that exist, the solutions and the problems that people still have. I, that that is that is great. So yeah, l love that kind of research. Like it's kind of a, a pre-built competitive analysis <laughs> that is that is happening there. Um, th that makes a lot of sense. And any other ways of figuring out this information? Well, I want to I want to address something you said before, and maybe um, respectfully disagree a little bit. It it is optimal <laughs> if you can figure out your niche ahead of time and before you're selling. That is true. But if any of your listeners are in a position saying, oh, no, I'm already selling and I'm keeping my language calm because no is not the word that I would go to if I was listening and thinking, oh, I'm, you know, how did I do this wrong? I, you know, brands are evolutionary. And sometimes you have to get into it to find where you need to go. So let me give you an example. A lot of people know Airbnb right that that company what a lot of people might not know is they started with a niche that was too small they were targeting uh cities and areas that had conferences where the conference attendance exceeded the hotel capacity okay very specific so like the the, the national conventions in the u.s you're right the democratic Na national convention the republican national convention maybe south by southwest you know, really huge uh, conferences where there was going to be a greater need for accommodations than the supply the hotels had. And so those were the situations they were serving. Um, and there weren't enough of them to keep the company afloat. Uh, but in the meantime, people were pinging them saying, hey, I had a great time staying in Austin at, at this, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to vacation in Austin. Do you have another location? And, and initially they were declining those. And then a bell went off, you know, <laughs> maybe it doesn't have to be just for conferences. And so they adjusted and widened their niche uh, in the process of building their brand. And that's how they came to grow so large. Mm, yeah, L large and, and uh, highly precarious in, in many ways too, right? Like yes. when you look at, at these these unicorns, I feel particularly from the perspective of a bootstrap founder who is, does not have access to that kind of capital, the venture capital that's put into it, and it feels like they overexpanded their niche. That's also something interesting because you we already talked about picking too small a niche, but let's maybe talk about picking too big a niche because Airbnb is essentially trying to take all of the, the hotel market and all the vacation home markets and you know all these markets at the same time and obviously if you have like billions in funding that's fine but if you have your savings you know your a couple months of life savings that's probably not a good idea to to invest that into trying to revolutionize the hotel market either so how what is too big of a niche to start in like where where, did, where is the the niche so big that you can't find your footing well, so let me uh, just on an Airbnb basis, because I think this brings up a really interesting point about niches that your uh, listeners might um, find interest in or, or get some benefit from. So what Airbnb is doing now is they shifted from this very specific, very narrow personal 
uh, interest um, and, and through their evolution several years in did a whole bunch of research and they changed their niche to um, or, or their purpose to help people belong anywhere right to pay, help anyone belong anywhere and so their niche is this market of people who travel who want to feel less alien less strange to a new place right and they do that by going into someone's home instead of going into a hotel room and now that they've launched all their experiences they do that by signing up for something that people in the know would have access to right so um so their niche is attitudinal right i want to belong in san francisco even though i've only ever been there twice in my life um, and i want to feel comfortable there and so i'm using their brand to help me do that um, so it, attitude is also an interesting niche to um, to address. Um, but in terms of being too big, when are you being too big? It's if your brand's not resonating with the people that you really want to serve. Um, if you're not being specific enough, you know. Um, so like my target market, I, I work with lots of people I work at, and some of my clients are men, some are women, some may be non-binary. I, I, you know, I don't know all the time. I don't ask, but you know, for a long time, I noticed a pattern that there were, most of my clients were men in their forties and fifties who had started a company who had come to it without a business education. Um, generally they were sports fans. They were married, um, and uh, and they enjoyed American culture. And so if you read my newsletter, which I publish once a month, I write with that person in mind. You know, I will make sports references once in a while. I will make American cultural references. I think in my next newsletter, I'm talking about Star Trek. But um, Very good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, but um, it, so, you know, when you can do insider stuff like that, so that person doesn't feel like you're talking, you're up making a general speech to hundreds of thousands of people, but instead you're talking to me, then you know you're doing well with your niche. That's great. That, that, that is such a, yeah, that, that is so visceral to me because if, if I read a text that is written not for me, I, I notice because it doesn't resonate with me on, on those little things. But if there's a Star Trek reference in there, you have my attention, right? And I know you, you did you did that on purpose too. Like you did that because you want to talk to me. That's when, yes. what I see in, in that kind of newsletter. The, that is very interesting. And I feel, let's talk about a bit about the, the evolution of the, the brand that allows you to do this. Because we just talked about Airbnb going from tiny niche to becoming this kind of experiential attitudinal thing, which is a great observation. I, I think this is what many tech companies have figured out that it's not about like being in that tech space, but being something aspirational for people, right? We want people to allow themselves to become a better version of themselves. And that is our, our purpose. But that takes, that takes a while to, to come to that point, right? It takes a, an evolutionary process. So how does that work for a brand? Like how do brands grow up? What are the signs? Are they, are they getting rowdy when they come into the teenage years? Like, how does it work? Um, well, so w what I noticed, it, uh, and the reason I came to this is when I was serving all of those guys who were in businesses, you know, and I talked to them about their business and marketing, and they really were very sheepish and said, you know, I don't like marketing, I don't do marketing, because they really didn't understand it, and they were afraid they were going to sink money into it and time into it and not see any return for it. Um, but the common trajectory of a lot of their brands was that they would start off and they'd find a lot of takers and it would go really well for several years and then they hit a plateau and when they hit this plateau it was mind-boggling because they said I'm saying all the same things I was saying before I'm talking to the same people I was talking before and all of a sudden I can't seem to get above this this level you know or or I'm tapering off a little bit and um, what I discovered, and the reason I call it a brand adolescence, is that brands evolve over time, right? So that definition of a brand that I talked to you about earlier, about being the sum of all your experiences and all your impressions, you know, when you first launch a brand, when on day one, if you're a founder, you get to tell the world what your brand is, what you intend it to be. But if you're 
uh, once your audience has a chance to experience it for a year or two years, they're going to have all these different interactions. Maybe it's still all with you if you're a solopreneur, but maybe you're lucky enough to be growing and they're having interactions with your employees or they're seeing reviews online or they're talking to other people who are using this totally away from your, your earshot. They can't, you can't hear what's going on. And all those activities factor into their impression of the brand. And if they're finding that your brand is better for one thing um, that's not what you launched it for, over time, you know, the difference between what you said your brand was on day one and what it is in their mind starts to separate. It grows further and further apart. And when the gap gets big enough, your initial marketing messages no longer resonate because they're not speaking to the way that people think of your brand. And so the way to deal with that is to stay in touch with your customers, listen to how they're using your brand, listen to what it means to them, you know, listen to their thoughts about it so that you can stay on track with the way that it is uh, appearing in the world. Hmm. Interesting. I, I think a lot of that is also word of mouth, right? Where people just talk to their peers about your yes. business and what you offer. And, and, and I know that a lot of founders at some point, they, they feel they lose control of word of mouth, obviously, because it's other people doing the work. What is your opinion on that? Like, do, 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 should people try to cling to that or should they just embrace what people are saying and kind of guide it like in, in a different way? So there was a McKinsey study, McKinsey Consulting study back in 2009 that showed that two thirds of marketing is happening outside the company. And it's because of all of all the internet related, right? Because of reviews, because of ratings, because of social media, because of conversations people are happening, uh, are having. So what I'd say to your founders is take a big exhale and realize that a lot of the marketing of your brand, a lot of the conversation is going to happen away from you and you cannot control it, but you can influence it, okay? And the way you influence it is by being consistent in the way that you put it out in the world. And so if you're a solo and you're continuing to um, lead the brand yourself, then you need to find out how the world perceives you and how the world perceives your brand and be consistent with those. And that's another thing I talk about in the book. Those are called brand attributes, you know. So, you know, one attribute you might have, Arvid, is kind of technical because people know you from, you know, that's, that's sort of a common thread through your businesses. Um, and so um, when you talk, you're talking to an audience who's coming to you for things that are technical and you, you know, you're not talking to me about, you know, how to bake donuts or something like this is out of the wheelhouse. You're serving that expectation and the voice and the language you use also acknowledges, you know, that kind of technical bent. So people need to find out how they're perceived, how their brand is perceived and kind of stay consistent about that. And when they do that, that will help um, the way that uh, people outside talk about them and think about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking about like the, the difference between a serious brand and an adult brand. I, I don't know like if, if that if that makes sense to you, but I, I'm hearing you tell me like you, you want to stay consistent. You, you should stay consistent in the messaging and the kind of communication that you, you give for, to allow people to have the opportunity to use that and talk to their peers in the same way and have this kind of cohesive narrative going on in the world outside of your marketing activities because other people are doing it and inside of them because that just keeps it going. Now, over time, I think... If many, particularly in the tech field, people have this ex, uh, expectation of things becoming more serious, more enterprise, right? More business. Oh, uh, yeah. And that's kind of what I mean, the difference between a, like a, a serious brand and a grown-up brand, like where one is just a little bit older because it's been around for a couple of years. And then there's the serious version, the one that uses fancy words and jargon to communicate something uh. and loses its kind of personal touch. So should we aim for that? I mean, it's a no. loaded question, obviously. <laughs> you know, can we be serious without that? Oh, yeah. You, yeah not only can you be serious, but, you, you know... That the problem with thinking, oh, my business is now six or seven years old, I have to get very formal about it, is that the reason people came to you and the reason you are where you are is the way you've been all the way along, 
right? The voice you use, like, you know, Wendy's is a, is a you know, fast food chain, and they're really kind of snarky um, on Twitter. And they're known for that. They kind of have an attitude. They go after McDonald's every once in a while. They tease them. And they're a huge, large, well-established brand. And people love the snark. They love the rebellious attitude. That's, that's how they're known. And so getting larger isn't a time to bail on the way that your brand has been. I would say, on the other hand, it's a time to lean in. You know, if you're talking to your customers and they love, you know, the, the casualness of your, um, of your blog posts and the ease of your manuals of use and all of that stuff, don't ditch that, you know, lean into that so that if you're growing and you need to hire employees, you need to kind of codify what your values are and how you want the employees to represent your brand so it can be consistent so you can continue that, not so you can become stodgy. Nobody wants stodgy. Yeah, f company culture doesn't have to be like casual Friday, right? That that's not what the culture is about. It could just be be kind, be be friendly, be yes. easy, be be kind, playful, right? These kind of things. And yes. and other companies might not do that because I don't know they target a different market or they just want to appear different in front of their customers. Also fine, just making a choice and sticking with it. I I like that. I like I like consistency. Generally, I'm a big fan of that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in episode two hundred something of this podcast at this point, right? So right. consistency is. Is, is central for me to to build uh, for building a business or a media business or a brand to begin with, and it's nice to hear that that is something that will keep attracting people. I think that's the fear that so many founders have, right? Oh, I, I'm going for bigger businesses. Their expectations are different. I need to change that. And then they have this this weird dichotomy where they now want to change who they are for the people that they want to attract, but in that lose the the connection with the people that they have already attracted. That is that that feels like such a such a hard balance to strike. Well, it's a hard balance to strike, and also, I mean, it's it's sort of, you, you know, your brand it, it it's an asset that you've built, right? You've you've worked so hard in the beginning, in the first whatever it is. I mean, the tech world, you know, tech world, it's like dog years, right? You know, a brand <laughs> could be you know an adolescent at two years old because it it gets adopted so fast, and there's so many things that it goes through. But um, you've worked really hard to differentiate yourself with a brand personality, with the values you bring to the culture, whether it's you personally or whether you have a team. You know, so that becomes an asset. That's valuable. You don't want to throw that away, right? You want to build on that. I mean, think of the early days of your brand and the culture that you're building in the company as a foundation, right? So you're not going to build stories upon that by ditching the foundation, you know, by, by ruining it or putting cracks in it. You're going to want to make sure it's solid and then just go up from there. I've also had the experience that your initial customers, like the people who are your first believers, they can play a pretty big role in you establishing that foundation and then going from there, right? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. They they can be your biggest fans. Their word of mouth and um, their influence bringing you, you know, the first, the, like sort of that second round of users is critical. And and if you can make them love you, you know, there are books that, that talk about them like raving fans, make raving fans. And I think Kevin Kelly had a in the Technium had the, a post years ago called, you know, a thousand, a thousand raving percent. fans and basically saying, if you can get a thousand raving fans, you have a business, you know, you're good because they're going to buy whatever you, you sell. So um, those initial customers are really important. Yeah, I've, the, the, Kev, the Kevin Kelly quote came to my mind as well, because that's kind of how I, I personally approach this. I mean, I have a couple more than a thousand followers at this point, but I know that a true fan is still not just a follower. Right. Uh, yes. Or a, a customer. A customer is not necessarily a true fan. They could just be a user of the product that you offer. Do you have any tips on how to find these fans, like how to kind of sift through the hopeful masses of people who, you know, are involved in using a product or, or hanging out with you on social media and find the ones that really, really care about you and then cater to their needs? So what I would say is... Um, Sometimes when you're starting a business, you're moving so fast and juggling so much that you kind of put off responding to anybody who uh, connects with you, you know. And I would say 
that the way to find those raving fans is to keep your eyes and ears open for someone who's engaging with you because the person who's taking a time to engage, whether it's a, a Twitter direct message or an email or however they're doing it, um, has gone through a lot to sort of raise their hand and make that effort. And that is the, the sign that this person could be very, very, um, you know, important to your brand and has a lot of thoughts about that. And those are the people you want to pay attention to. So, you know, when I get comments on posts on social media or when I get responses to my newsletter, I try to respond as fast as possible and keep the conversation going. And that's how I learn about, you know, the most engaged, um, you know, audience that I have. Um, because, um, you know, they're, they're willing to share their thoughts. They're happy to share their thoughts. They'll also tell you where you're wrong. And there's a lot of learning that can happen there. Um, but also a lot of people who, um, even if they say to you, I'm writing to you because you messed up X, if you engage in the right way, not only do they become a raving fan because you're willing to listen to them and you're willing to learn from them, but they feel a connection to you now, right? That's the relate That goes back to the relationship building, right? You want to build these connections and the people who feel most strongly connected to your brand are the people who are going to raise their hand and, and, and try to reach out. Yeah, people who care enough to even reach out, right? Like that's, yes. that's already quite the indicator. But I think many founders, they, they think uh, they can get people to talk about their product by just like working on the product and making it better, like making it more exciting and more usable, which is somewhat true, right? Like better product is something that people would talk about more just because they have more reason to talk about the product. But the product really doesn't matter as much as you just helping somebody with their problem. I had this experience building Feedback Panda with my girlfriend. The, the people who reached out to us in the beginning, the first couple of customers, again, in, initial customers that reached out that had a problem but wanted it solved because they saw potential in the platform. I spent sometimes half an hour chatting with them through the chat system on our website. And those, almost all of them became evangelists for the product. Right? They were just regular online teachers doing their job, but they took the time out of their day to whenever they saw somebody talk about a similar problem to one that we solved to kind of pitch us as a solution to that problem because they, they knew they were even often saying, Hey, these people, they will actually help you when you have a problem because for some reason it is an outstanding capability of a business to actually help people through their customer service at this point. Yes, yes, it is. And it's the most important thing because, again, the definition of a brand is the sum of all the experiences they have. And if they had an experience where, wow, I can't believe Arvid took a half an hour out of his day to chat with me and he's now considering the suggestion I had for software, now I'm invested in that, right? Now I feel like I've contributed and I'm a part of it and I'm connected to you and I want other people to know how wonderful this is. Yeah, that's, that's right. I often would actually build the features that people were asking about or suggesting while I was talking to them and then kind of secretly <laughs> pushing it to production because it was a very lean, very flexible approach. And then I would tell them, yeah, just refresh the page, check it out. And their, their minds were blown. Right? Yeah. That, that's that, just that moment of actually mattering as a customer in, in the lifetime of a product that was so novel to all these people who were just using these gigantic like Google products, right? If you go to Google Drive or use Google Sheets or whatever, you probably won't impact the business direction of that particular product with a, with a comment to their, their customer service. But if you do that to a SaaS product built by an indie hacker somewhere, it's quite likely that your suggestion is going to make the feature list, right? So that is something that most people that we serve did not know before because they only ever used these gigantic products or products built by gigantic companies. And that was already such a differentiator when they talked about solutions in the space, right? Oh yeah, you have these, these, and these, but they don't really care about you, but here's Feedback Panda. They seem to really care. That was that was super strong of a, yeah. of a differentiator that, that we used. We, we wrote that wave. Like most of our marketing, if not all, was word of mouth with that business. We didn't, we, we tried paid, cust uh, paid customer acquisition at some point. Didn't really work. Didn't need to because people were already talking about a product and we just amplified their voices. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's a, a long standing comment in marketing which is a, a, a truism, which is that people have to know, like, and trust you before they'll buy from you. And so the the anything you can do to get along that continuum where people get to know you, they they like what you're doing or they like who you are or they like the way you're treating them, and then they trust you to do things in a manner that warrants their their money and their attention. Um, those are that's the precursor to you having a customer. Mm. 
I think liking is, is an interesting um, verb here, like to, to be liked. I think most people in the indie hacker space, and I might be overgeneralizing, but a lot of them, they're introverted. They're trying to, you know, just to do a thing, be technical, build a product, and, you know, not to do too much with people. And I, I think particularly because I'm such a person myself, I always felt, uh, if, if I reach out to them, if I talk to them, they might not like me. And by extension, the brand, the business, the product that I represent. So I always felt um, a kind of a, hi a hindrance that I put in myself. It was, it was just a mental blockage. But you know how people are, right? Our, our brain often fights itself in many ways. And trying to encourage people to talk about my product felt desperate or needy on my end. I know now, having done it and having understood that it's not that, that that was just, uh, you know, a construction that my mind uh, put in there to, I don't know, protect itself from change or whatever. But for an introverted founder who is having trouble understanding that marketing or encouraging word of mouth is not desperate or needy, how, how would you help them overcome this particular blockade in their mind? Well, I would say most people want to help, especially if they've reached out to you, but most people want to help. And so um, for an, in, you know, because I, I come across as an extroverted personality, but I definitely have a, an introverted part to me also. And what helps me and what I would suggest to you is think of it as just a one-to-one -one interaction. Don't think of it as you are broadcasting to the world. If some, if you're reaching out to someone, it's just two people having a conversation, you know, and the worst that they could say is no. Right. That's yeah. it. And, and right. so, but, but, you know, my dad has a wonderful saying, he's like, give yourself the option, you know, cause you don't know if you don't ask. And so I would think about that is, you know, it, it, maybe no doesn't feel good, but most of the time you're going to get a yes. or most of the time you're going to get an answer. And that feels so good. And so far outweighs the shyness, you know, the, the aversion to being in contact. So that's what I would say. Focus on it. It's a one-to-one -one conversation and that's all that's at stake right now. That's great. I also, I think people saying no, that's just a regular part of life. And if you can separate this kind of, this identity of the business from yourself as a human being, right? Like even though you might be the person behind the business, the, the only person behind the business, you start conflating the business with yourself. But a no to the business is not a no to you. Like they don't hate you as a person because they don't want to use your software. Like to, to tear that apart and see the no as a business decision on the side of a potential customer that still thinks you're a great human being, that could probably help you with approaching them, right? In, in a conversation, like to deconflate, de deflate, I don't know the word for that, but you know, like taking these things apart, um, that, that certainly helps me. Because if somebody doesn't want to, I don't know, sponsor this podcast or, you know, my newsletter or, you know, buy my book or whatever it is, I don't see this as an attack on myself. I see this as somebody's budgeting choice, right? And it's it's all about what they think is good for their business as a tool at this point. It's not about my personal likability. That that's entirely true. And you know, I'm I'm a writer, um, and so writers are really used to a lot of rejection because more often than not, yeah. you get a no. And what you learn over time is that the no rarely has to do with you. It often has to do with what's going on in the person's life, uh, you know, to whom you're making the request. It has to do with budget strings that are beyond contr their control. It has to do with so many things. And I will tell you, there's this great. Um, I'm going to, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I'm going to say Zhi Zhang, but um, he did this um, experiment called 100 Days of Rejection. And so he tried, he, he said, I'm going to try and get rejected 100 days in a row to thicken my skin. Um, and if you Google uh, or, or, you know, search for 100 Days of um, Rejection, you'll find his videos. They're hilarious. And what you see is he learned it wasn't about him. It was often about the people. And a lot of times when he tried to get rejected, he actually got a yes. And so it's just very entertaining. And it also kind of helps you get out of the mindset. It's not about you. It has to do with the circumstances in the moment. Mm -hmm. That's probably one of the biggest reasons why people fear marketing. Is the, the moment you talk to other people, you, you don't have this kind of clearly defined, I don't know, programming API that will either tell you a yes or a no reliably on the input that you put there, right? It's, you, you can't, right. You, you don't know what's going to happen. And I think lots of people are afraid of that moment. So I'm, I'm glad that you're kind of teaching people at the, with this 
that it's fine to be rejected or to fear rejection, and it's actually a strengthening move. It's kind of what doesn't kill you, make you makes you stronger, but put into you know an interpersonal relationship. Well, and then also, you know, if someone says no, instead of risking that you're going to go and feel, you know, like you've shrunk into a tiny, tiny thing, you could also muster your courage and say, okay, I understand. Could you tell me why? Mm-hmm. And when yeah. you hear the reasons, that will often diffuse your chances of, of feeling awful because then you see that it's not you. <laughs> You know, I don't have the money or corporate just asked us to cut our budget by 10% and and I can't add anything new or, you know, this doesn't exactly fit my need, but I think what you're doing is really great. You get messages like that and it kind of saves you. So if you can muster the courage to ask why, you can save yourself a lot of angst. I like that because when I'm thinking about validation in, in all all uh, varieties of product validation, market validation, solution validation, whatever, problem validation too, I'm, I'm always reminded of the fact that no theory can ever be proven. You can only disprove it, right? You can add more evidence for it to maybe be true, but the, the counter example might just be right around the corner and you never know because it could always happen. So the only thing you can do to any theory is to invalidate it and getting a no and a why leads you so much closer to a potential invalidation than a yes even though the yes is great for your business but you you, you haven't learned anything the only thing that you've learned is okay this is yet another kind of uh, argument for what i'm currently doing but the no and the why will give you much clearer insight into why what you're currently doing may not be the perfect version of itself just yet so yes. there is value in the no but yes. maybe even more than than in the yes you do learn a lot from those well, yeah, it's, uh, the, I think um, what I'm glad about in the indie hacker founder community is that failure isn't demonized. I think like failing or making mistakes, that's just accepted as a regular part of doing something that nobody else has ever done before, right? That's just what entrepreneurship is. It's like building something that did not exist in this particular kind of state ever before. Of course, you're going to make mistakes. Might just yes. as well embrace them. No, absolutely, absolutely. And you need to give yourself the space for that because um, it's going to happen over and over again. And the more resilient you become, um, the quicker you can recover and just keep moving forward. And in terms of personal brands, that is part of your journey. That's part of the the whole that you then present to the world, right? You yes. trying stuff, not it not working out, but you persevering and still building more things that do eventually work out. Now that's quite the story, which is why building in public is such a such a great thing. I love that. I love watching people having making little mistakes, recovering, and then coming out on top. That's just the most enjoyable thing that I, that you could possibly see. And there's a lot of compassion out there. You know, people relate to, because it's so human to fail, everybody can relate to it. And so when you share that in public, like, okay, I, I put all my resources into this avenue and I got, I hit a dead end. And so now I'm going to try the other way. People, people, you know, feel for you. They, they there's an emotional reaction of compassion there. Yeah, and and compassion and just being relatable, that just builds this relationship, right? That is what connection needs. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Well, th- thank you so much, Evelyn, for, for sharing all these things. Like that, that was a wonderful, um, brand building masterclass today. And I love the fact that it's, that it's so relationship centric because I think we can all just improve everything around what we do by making it more about building long term positive win-win relationships with other people. So thank you so much for sharing everything you shared. Um, where can people find you, find more about you and your work? Uh, so my website is eStarassociates.com and star is spelled with two R's like Ringo. Um, so they can go to my website to find out more about me, to find out about my book, Teenage Waste Brand, How Your Brand Can Stop Struggling and Start Scaling. They can also find that on Amazon or bookshop.org or uh Anywhere you you buy books, you can find it. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, you know, if you kind of like what I have to say, but you, you know, I'm not ready or to share any funds, or you're building in public and need every penny for what you're doing, penny because I'm in the U.S. Um, <laughs> I would say you could also at my website sign up for my varsity marketing newsletter, which is only once a month. I don't stuff mailboxes and includes a brand story um, every single month. That's awesome. 
Yeah, well, very, very highly recommended all of this. So thank you so, so much for being on today. And I, I would like to close this with live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> And that's it for today. Thank you for listening to The Bootstrap Founder. You can find me on Twitter at Arvid Kahl, A-R-V-I-D-K-A-H-L. You'll also find my books and my Twitter course there. And if you want to support me and the show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Get the podcast in your podcast player of choice. Tell your friends about it. That'd be nice. And leave a rating and the review by going to ratethispodcast.com slash founder. Any of this will truly help the show. So thank you very much for listening and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.